I don't think about it because my the rest of my studio is a uh, disaster. I, yeah, you would. Uh, the police would be called if you could see the rest of my studio. <laughs> okay. Crime scene. This is the one like square, uh, right? Looks like a normal person's room. I think Zach um, Davison called it the um, the wall of credibility. <laughs> yeah, it's not even. It's just by happenstance. That's all right. The, the only. That's... Also, this is your uh, the camera set up on my workspace right now, so this yeah. is sort of. My natural. This is where I am when I'm working. So. <laughs> Clicking. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, the the laptop's gone, and I'm I'm a uh, I'm still I still work traditionally on paper. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I'm it's, I'm a holdout. No, I you know I don't know. See, it's really strange. We've you know I've had a lot. I've talked to a lot of people. You know over the years doing this and not to mention, you know, you know, listen, when I did this for a living, when I did comics for a living, there was no option, but to do it, you know, with yeah. paper. And it's interesting to see the people who are like our peer age who hopped, you know, they hopped early and they went digital. And, you know, I talked to um, Phil Jimenez and, you know, Phil went digital to do uh, Historia. And yeah. You know, and he's like, it's like for better or for worse, like for the amount of like effort he had to put into it. So, to well, he, he, I think he's addicted to effort. Like, <laughs> he puts a ton of effort into when it was on paper and when, when it's digital, but the, you can't argue with the results on Historia. I don't think that could be accomplished with how, um, traditional you know, the layers that you can generate on, you know, I mean, digital artwork. So, it would, I mean, the, the the ridiculous level of painting that would be involved to get that sort of, you know, yeah. it's just not, it's not realistic anymore. You know, I think that's like Alex Ross's territory left and maybe a handful of others in the world, but it's just not a, it's not a thing anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Well, Phil, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Um, yeah been you've been you've been definitely one of the people who i was you know i i you know it's when you get in the comic business you start that's when you kind of look around and like okay who's here you know uh, <laughs> you know it, it's like you know when you get in you know who's already there because those are the people you were looking at on the on the racks every month but then you get in you're like who else is here and then you start noticing new people you know because maybe you weren't reading the books that you know Right. Your, your peers were, you know, producing, um, you know, I, I don't like, it took a while to realize, you know, what Chris Bacella was doing, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, like that shades an amazing book, you know, and you start digging into that. And um, we were in our studio, my, my studio partner came back one day, these black and white copies of Duncan uh, Ferreira's artwork on oh, yeah. a movie adaptation of um, California. Uh -huh. which never saw print but yeah, it's like no right no one has but it's like but we had the whole issue in black and white in our hands and it was just this revelation um oh yeah yeah so it's it's kind of cool so you were one of those people i was like oh well that you know who's his cat and what's his cat up to you know because you know i've i've always been really you know like you say that like you know i feel like addicted to to effort <laughs> yes. you know like I, I think I fell more into that category than, you know, sort of someone who was like approaching it with a, like a, a stylized vision of like how I'm going to achieve, you know, something. So I, uh, I, I've always looked at the people who are doing things like with a very, with a unique approach versus like, what's the spin on traditional comics. Right. I, I it was, so you were in that category and that was really cool. So. Well, awesome. Glad to hear that. Yeah. And then it's just kind of cool. Like Twitter has been great in the terms of like seeing, you know, oh, like, oh, there, there's Phil, you know, there's all these people who like, you know, when you get out of the business, they, you kind of forget. Yeah. What happened? They, they become phantoms of the past. And, totally. Like yeah. I was talking to, talking to Casey Jones not too long ago, you know, Casey got out of the business after I got out of the business and also now he's back, you know, doing mm. stuff on Instagram. It's like, wow, okay. And it's cool to kind of catch up with these, with these people. Um, and uh, you and I don't have any past, but we'll, we'll become fast friends today. <laughs> sure. <laughs>
<laughs> so um you are in iowa yes i'm in the i'm in a very small town in iowa that's mm -hmm. not but it's not too far away from iowa city which is the home of the university of iowa yeah so that's sort of our that's sort of the cultural hometown for my family i mean i'm i'm an alumnus my kids are alumni and um it's where we go when we want to watch you know see a film or go mm -hmm. to a concert or so it's it's kind of neat to be to I, so i have definitely have that combination of rural life and and city life yeah. but from day to day it's you know very i mean you know nobody here locks their cars or their doors or right. anything like that that's good yeah we we have to lock our lock our cars we have bears <laughs> yeah we don't have bears. we don't have that like it's it's nature but it's it's tamed yeah <laughs> like we we won out we won over here <laughs> yeah um yeah we're still fighting that battle up here in the appalachian mountains um well so i i so university of iowa correct me if i'm wrong has one of the greatest writing departments yes in the world yeah the Iowa's, iowa writers workshop um is a mecca we're one of the I don't want to sound like the Chamber of Commerce, but it's <laughs> we're we're one of the UNESCO cities of literature. Uh, okay, I think there's three of them in the world, and wow. it's one of them because just so many fine writers have spent some time here, either as students or instructors in the writers workshop. And when I was an undergrad, I had to I I had a decision point in my career because I was spending a lot of time in in writing courses and a lot of time working on my BFA and I had to, like, I had two professors that were like, well, you need to make a call. You need to become one or the other. Yeah. You need to try to get into the work writer's workshop or you need to go to grad school for drawing. And I was like, I am instead going to get married and start drawing comics, you know, <laughs> you disappoint everybody. Yeah, I'm out. Um, I'm going to do both of those things, but not as well. Right. Um, so yeah, I, because I was already uh, a work. Well, I wouldn't say full time professional, but I was already getting paid to make comics. Okay, I was still in school, and so it was easy for me to make make a call. Yeah, like why why keep getting trained for the thing I want to do? I mean, you get you get sweet yeah. like forty or fifty bucks a page. So how how could you? I was making thirty five dollars a page, which I thought was um, a king's ransom. Oh, when you're, well, when you're 19, it is. Yeah. You know, because I think minimum wage at the time was under five bucks. So. Yeah, no, it definitely seemed like a lot of, a lot of dough. Um, of course, it seems like a lot. Uh, it's easy if you're a publisher, you know, those fly by night publishers of the eighties, it was easy to offer those kind of rights if you had no intention of ever paying them. Fair enough. You know? And I mean, so I, I wound up, I, I was stiffed a lot in those early days, but still I I could put the feather in my cap that I was a, I was a professional. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, let's have, I'm, so, I mean, like, so the right, so the writing thing was a real thing for you. Like that was like, oh, yeah. you were like, you were locked into that along with the, and you were sort of blessed with the sort of the, the bug for writing and the bug for drawing. So you. Yeah. They're inseparable. They're inseparable tasks to me. Yeah. They're all yeah. parts. They're all just like different. It's like if if storytelling is uh you know ra the radio band, mm -hmm. writing and drawing are just different stations along that band. Yeah. Um so I it's just that to the to the commercial comics world my skills as a as a, as an artist were more readily, you know, usable. Yeah, my writer skills right away. And I enjoy both equally. And so I took, you know, I don't care how you want me as long as you want me. So I, you know, working in comics was pretty much all I wanted to do since I was 12. So um, okay, any entry into that world was uh, welcome by me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It is an interesting thing that how like, we do lock into that stuff, you know, whatever the things we're locked into, we lock in 12, it seems to be some sort of like stationary point where like, okay, this yeah. stuff is going to stick with us for a long time. This is the, the stuff that looks like fun. Um, but when I do talk to like young creators or young people that are interested in art or animation or, 
you know, writing or whatever. I was telling that the most, I mean, what you're selling is your creativity. Mm -hmm. and, um, what you need to be, you need to be flexible enough to go where it takes you. Because I was locked in. I'm going to be a comic book artist when I was 12. Yeah. yeah. But I, I've had jobs as an ed editorial cartoonist for newspaper. You know, I've designed ads for, you know, print. I've designed toys, worked storyboarded for film and television and animation. All those things um, that came about because of the skills I developed as a, as a cartoonist. It's yeah. I mean, it's an incredibly diverse skill set that a you know cartoonist, you know, especially for comic books, has to have. I remember in the in the nineties, and I don't know if you went to San Diego off, often in the nineties. Yeah. but There was that period around like 95, 90, around ninety five when the animation studios were ramping up because animation was becoming a thing again, and they were just cherry picking all these really great comic book artists because of the breadth of skills I could bring like, Oh yeah. I, rem I remember I got a, I got a cup of coffee with the Batman show. Mm -hmm. I ordered for a very short time with the Batman show. Um, without submitting any storyboards. Yeah. I sent them issues of the wretch, uh, the comic that I wrote and drew and they ran an ad that, cause, cause up to that time, everybody that wanted to get into animation wanted to do Daffy duck or Roadrunner. or, so they didn't have a lot of people with adventure storytelling chops. Yeah. And so they, I, I don't know if you remember, they ran a full paid ad in the CBG, the comics buyer's guide saying we need storyboard artists. I kind of remember someone talking about that. Yeah. That can draw superheroes and send your samples. And I didn't, I didn't even, I wasn't 100% sure what a storyboard artist was responsible right. for. Um, but Mike Carlin, the DC editor had given me the, like the five C's of cinematography and that okay. has storyboard samples in it. And I'm like, well, I think I can do that. That's a lot like comics. Yeah. And I just sent in issues of books I was working on and there said, yeah, look, here's a couple scenes. Let's go. And wow. I got to do a few uh, and I got to stay here. I got to stay at home. I didn't have to go out to LA. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like a, a college friend of mine lives in, I'm going to say somewhere maybe around the Kansas City play city kind of I don't know somewhere around there and um he I mean he lives in a small town but he yeah. like he he kind of cut his teeth and did his time in LA and he's like I he's like he's got a great gig and he's not living in LA not living in New York yeah. and it's a it's a kind of a good get, good good thing but I think going I want to just dive back a couple of sure. things that you said um one, I think it's really super important for people to understand the storytelling principles. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you can draw the storytelling principles, you can write the storytelling principles. And, right. and while it might not seem as nice either direction, you can also like draw it if you can write it. Like it, right. it doesn't need to be a finished piece of beautiful illustration, but you can tell the story. Yeah. And I think like, especially you know when you're if you're starting out in the business like don't try to limit yourself like i know i was so focused on being a penciler yeah like, that's the guy who had the long hair and the microphone <laughs> and was cool and everybody was saying you're the penciler you know right. you're um, the lead, you're the lead guitarist yeah it, and it was but it's so funny because it's like it, it's all the same thing listen coloring is storytelling you know inking is story, like all of it is storytelling and I think that's a really, I think just kind of making sure that like when people think about themselves, don't just pit, pigeonhole yourself and say, this is the one thing that I can do because those opportunities that you listed are due to the fact that you had this sort of understanding and principle and you were able to apply it to whatever it was in front of you. Yeah. I, I think that's spot on because my, my actual, um, my actual drawing chops are not super uh, high fidelity. You know, it's it's more about when people hire me, they're not hiring me because I can draw like Frank Frazetta. Right. Um, they're hiring me because there's something about my my style that they enjoy, but also because they know the story's going to be communicated clearly. 
or effectively or in a sort of innovative way. Mm -hmm. Hopefully all three of those things. Yeah. It's um, entertaining. Yeah. But that's why I'm, that's why I'm hired. I'm not hired to, um, you know, <laughs> pose on stage, you know, right. To do, right. To do what Phil does. <laughs> yeah. Or Phil Jimenez. So, I mean, yeah, like the different, this is that you're doing what you're filling. You filled. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the other thing I wanted to kind of go back a bit was you're not in New York. No. You're not in L.A. I so, thought I was going to be. In high school, I yeah. I, I was so uh, into the romance of I'm going to pack yeah. up my portfolio and get on the bus and, you know, go live in a flop house. And right. Because I'd grown up reading um, Steranko's History of Comics. And, mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, Eisner's the dreamer. And I thought, Oh, that's what it's going to be like. I'm going to do that. And I was really into the romance of all that. And then um, I did, I fell in, fell in love with my wife in mm -hmm. high school and that, and I wanted to be near her. We did go to separate colleges that mm -hmm. were, but both in state. So we could see each other quite a bit. Um, but that changed my thinking. I'm like, well, I'm not, I don't have, do I have to go to New York? Right. And then, but then also, just technologically, uh, things had advanced. We're talking like the mid '80s. Yep. Um, FedEx sort of burst onto the scene in the mid '80s. Yeah. And faxing came along, and uh, you know the home computers started to you know inch along. But mo the most important thing was FedEx and faxing, and so yep. you could do more of comics remotely, and. Um, you still had to make trips to New York to get work. Yeah. And that became a, a part of my life, like take, you know, going out just to meet with editors and go to lunch and things like that. But uh, that part of the game has largely been replaced by social media and comic conventions. Yeah. You can no, do that's it's, it's so true. Cause it, it is like when I talk to people who are not wizened such as myself, <laughs> um, you know, I get that. I get this. You know, I'm I'm so fascinated by how the approach to getting into the business for them sort of coalesced yeah. in their experience. And you know, it's amazing because like so many people get you know got work because they were on like the forums in the early 2000s. I'm like, wow, oh, yeah, you know, like, what an interesting ex you know idea. But so I mean, but you're but once again, you're you're in Iowa. Like, how did you like you know, like you're you're a 12 year old saying this is my future. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. you're a 16 year old and you fall in love. You're like, okay, my future is going to be a little bit different, but it's still going to yeah. be this. Like, how do you frame that? And how do you, how do you go about getting work at that, at that age? Because you're going off to college and you're getting work when you're in school. Yeah. Well, I, I benefited from uh, some trends that were larger than any of us could, you know, could see from our own little personal vantage points. The turtles broke wide while I was in college. Yeah. And yep. overnight, uh, people saw how the turtles did um, sales-wise as comics. And overnight, anybody with a credit card uh, knew they could, uh, with even with a five thousand dollar limit, they they could if they could advance a printer four thousand mm -hmm. dollars and pay some chump a college kid in Iowa a thousand dollars to draw a comic, it was going to make ten thousand dollars. Right. Because comic shops at that time were so caught up in in speculation, they ordered everything. Yeah, and uh, like so, like even like a little indie startup book, you could be guaranteed you're going to sell ten, fifteen, twenty thousand copies. Yeah, um, and so overnight, the number of publishers really exploded, and um, the standard for, and they all needed talent, and the standard, of course, had to be lowered because you needed twenty more, twenty times more talent in comics. Sure. And that was the rung that was lower, you know, <laughs> that was the low rung near me. And that's the one I stepped on. Um, well, how did you, I mean, how did you connect with that? I mean, where was oh, it? Well, I was, um, I'm lucky I, since Iowa City was a college town, it had a comic shop. Okay. And um, I would go into that comic shop and buy every non-Marvel and DC book I saw. And I would take it back to my dorm room and I would copy the address off the Indicia Okay, and even yeah. if they didn't have an official submissions editor, they would get a submission from me. And, totally. and at, the, yep. at the same time, I was also like on a, 
I was I acted like my own editor. So like I gave myself assignments like I got to give Marvel and DC new samples from me every five months or so. Right. Because at that time, five months to me you know, seemed like a long time. Yeah. But to a submissions editor that, that was getting my crap, that was probably like, oh, it's this kid again. This is a third yeah. time this year. Right. You know, um, but also I also benefited from the fact that back then Marvel and DC would write back to you. Yep. Like if you even had a glimmer of talent, they would send um, you know, things you needed to improve on. And they were short, like two paragraphs, sometimes really dismissive. Yeah letters but sometimes they'd be very insightful and i'd get letters back from elliot brown or dick giordano or mike carlin or or jim shooter and and they would break down what was weak and strong about my work and it really helped yeah so it, it does it really doesn't take much you know for a person who has the sort of the whatever the the acuity sort of however rough it might be in their head and the determination, it doesn't take much feedback to accelerate that learning process. Yeah. I it's think the most the most important ingredient is uh, you have to be willing to put your ego aside and listen to what they're saying. Yeah. Because um, I, I, even though I went to a very small high school, our graduating class was 36 people, um, there was a guy in the class ahead of me who was a better comic book artist than I was in high oh. school. Like we were making our own comics together in high school, like for fun. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was the stud, you know, yeah. and I was the second banana. And we went to our first conventions together and we, uh, I don't back, back in the day, Chicago used to have like a portfolio room oh, that, okay. the that the editors would sit in. And they'd rotate, they'd come and go. But as a as a, an aspiring creator, you could literally spend the entire convention in the portfolio room. Sure. Showing your work to different editors. And I was with it, I was in line with him for a review. Oh, it was it was the aforementioned Mike Carlin who gave really insightful but really tough portfolio reviews. And yeah. he gave me one and I took, you know. I got my teeth kicked in, but I took the notes. You know, I I I knew what I needed to work on. My buddy, who was better than me, came next. He got his teeth kicked in, closed his portfolio, and stopped drawing comics. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I've always thought like I've always recognized like you know growing up there were always these always these people. That, you know, whatever the thing you did, there was always that kid who was really good at the thing that everyone else liked to do, but they never did it like they stopped doing it after a point and you know you always wonder like why did that happen but i mean i mean some people i mean it it's maybe it's largely out of their control part of their personality that's out of their control but you have right. to um you have to have a strong enough ego to believe my work is worth seeing for the outside world so i'm yeah. going to produce it but you have to have a a flexible enough mind to understand that like Yes, my voice deserves to be heard, but it's not perfect. So what can what can I do to improve my voice? Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. So what, what you're, when you're mind like, so you're, I mean, you're doing this like, so now you're, so you're hustling with, I mean, and, and that's, and, and listen, I think everyone should do that today. Maybe not get the address from the Indicia and, yeah. stuff, and the stuff out. But I mean, the thing is, is like to get the work, you need to just paper bill. Yeah. Know, higher industry because you have to be sort of like you know like you said so like delusional to think that like everyone needs to see this you know mm -hmm. and, and get it out there to get that hit so you started getting smaller smaller work how do you how do you parlay that like to what you would say was you know you know i guess a safe publisher work you know and you yeah uh, well it's to me is it's a steady progression like yeah. And part of it is the fact that the people you come in with at that at that lower level are the people that are going to be around 10 years later. Not right. all of them, but some yeah. of them. And so those are the people you come with up with and they know about you and they know what you can do and they've seen your growth. Um, so work comes from those relationships that you build, you know, when you're 20, 22 yeah. um, and you're not stuck in those. You're not stuck in that framework, 
but it's definitely like you know the the bed that you plant all those seeds in yeah and um at that time there was a sort of like i said the things are are totally different now and it's almost like breaking in advice for me is almost useless because a lot of these structures don't exist anymore but at that time there were these small publishers a little bit more legit publishers a little bit more legit publishers and you could sort of literally like a rung climb that ladder and you know marvel and dc would do anthologies there were a lot of prestige anthologies that you could worm your way into and looking back on it it seems like oh that was a long arduous slog for me but it was really like from 21 to 26 you know yeah. like 21 i'm doing terrible indie comics and at 26 i'm drawing swamp thing you know yeah. so it's but to me that seemed like an eternity you know but it was five years sure sort of trying to upgrade my gig not like and not upgraded in any sort of like mercenary way just like saying i i need a big i want a bigger audience or i want to do better work and um i wanted to work this more important or more seen so i try to angle for better gigs yeah it um and i have to say in my mind that status has never changed i'm 56 now and i'm still thinking like that i'm still thinking like oh my career is gonna you can start counting my career with the next job you know like the next yeah. job is the one that like i'm really gonna say what i want to say and it'll probably be that way till i'm not working anymore you put your pencil down yeah yeah it's it's i mean thinking strategically is super important in whatever whatever sort of endeavor people have i think there's that that classic you know phrase of like you know amateurs think tactics and professionals think strat strategy mm -hmm. like that's a big differentiator um and that's you know and I'll, I'll cite that i was terrible when it came to the <laughs> latter early on in my career so it took it took a while for me to realize oh i need to be thinking a few steps ahead right yeah it was it was always a little little tough was, were there any sort of like what you look back and say oh man these were some like pitfalls and mistakes that were just once that you're like you know man if i didn't do that you know yeah i i think i um i was so eager to work that i did not i didn't curate my assignments in any way so like if um a gig came around and it sounded good i would take it and even if it was out of character for my style or made me too busy at the moment um, right. and I probably should have not taken it and been so stressed out. Um, so I should have said yes to less probably and been more careful. And also, I also, I also had this weird idea when I started drawing comics that I was going to have two careers drawing comics. I was going to have one where I was doing like these um, kind of oblique art house comics. Mm-hmm like my really far out styles and then i was also going to draw like steve rude and alan davis you know so i was going to be like the cleanest brightest superhero guy yeah but i was also going to be like avant-garde collage you know of uh, xerography kind of artist totally and what i didn't know was like what people wanted to see from me was this like combination of those two things too. which was so, you. yeah yeah. yeah, but I thought, oh, they, because a lot of what I wanted to do was informed by what I saw when I was a kid. And I didn't see, you don't see a ton of really weird artists drawing Iron Man. No. You know? no. <laughs> and so, like, that's why Frank Miller is so important to me as a consumer and as a creator, was because when I saw him when I was like 13, when he really burst on the scene with Daredevil, yeah. Um, I saw, oh, this is a guy who's doing. A mainstream superhero comic but he's drawing a little bit different than mm. everybody else and it's yeah. a little and it's a little closer like i knew about the spirit so i knew there was other stuff out there i knew about ec so i was like this is a guy that's like kind of you know dredging, dredging up all that stuff that i loved about old stuff but very daring and new kind of storytelling very cinematic storytelling mm -hmm. and i was like yeah maybe i can maybe i can like make my way that way and um so uh so yeah i was hedging you know i was yeah, like yeah, yeah. i'm gonna do art comics for for my soul 
And then I'm going to do superhero comics to put a roof over my head. Right, for the fans. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. what I really needed to do, which is what I'm doing now, which is just being me. Yeah. And that's something I, um, when Tim Sale passed away, sadly, not too long ago. Yeah. Um, that was a lesson I learned from his career was just like, be yourself and let your people find you. Yeah. Don't try to be everything to everybody. Yeah. It, or be the thing that you be the th and don't be the thing that everybody already already has yeah. and loves. You know, like I love Jim Lee. I'm going to draw like Jim Lee. Like, yeah. cool. But we got Jim. Well, Lee. Yeah, and there's some aspect of that that you can't shed. Like, no, of course, when you're like 14 or whatever, and you see that somebody really galvanizes you, like the way uh, Frank Miller did me. Sure, you are going to imitate them for a few years, but. Mm -hmm if you really get to the core of what's great about him, it's the same thing with uh, Kirby. Like I, I'm so Kirby lit my fire, you know, yeah. love Kirby, but Kirby wouldn't want me to draw like him. No. You know, <laughs> he wants you to draw like you and that's, what's important about him. So like um, all those guys that like fire you up also want you to find your own path and be yourself, not oh, totally. to to emulate them. They, what they want is they really want to see something that makes them excited too. You know, right. also like, like we, when you make things, if you're whatever, it's music, writing, drawing, like you get so excited seeing something new, something unique, something different that really just charges your batteries up. So you can go, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta up my own game, you know, yeah. do something new and fun. Yeah. And also um, a lot of, a lot of, our drawing styles are beyond are out of our control. Um, yeah. I think we, there's a fiction out there that like, Oh, if you practice enough with this technique, if you, if you subscribe to this, to this school of drawing, you can make this, you can make your style what you want it to be. And that's, I've had that to be completely false. I mean, <laughs> you can improve your skills, Yeah, but your style is born out of uh, all sorts of things that you're great at. It's also born out of things that, out of your control or idiosyncratic habits you have or even your weaknesses um i was having an an argument with not an argument a discussion with a friend about ai ai art the other day okay. and i was mentioning that like the reason i don't think ai can really replace comic book or artists in general is a lot of times we like artists for what's messed up about their work you know, and we don't know how to we don't know how to articulate that, and the artist doesn't necessarily appreciate that themselves. Um, but that's not replicable uh, by any sort of like algorithm. Mm -hmm. You know, what's messed up about me is <laughs> what's unique to me. Yeah, um, well, and for, people... for handwriting. You know, like you can, you really can't change your handwriting. You know, there's. Right. It's it, you can you can morph it or whatever it, you can get better at it, but it's mm -hmm. there's just the way that you grip a pen. There's a way or, that you move. Yeah, or, or like a singer's voice, a singer can get trained. Yeah, um, you know, from here to demo, at the end of the time, but their voice still sounds like their voice. Yeah, and sometimes that's what that's what we love about it. It's an an ineffable thing. It's totally. And, we don't. Um, we, rarely is there a band we go like. This band sounds just like that other band that yeah. I really love. I love them equally. Like you don't. You typically yeah. go like, hmm, I don't know if I like that. Yeah, it's funny thing when you talk to artists about who their influences are, and sometimes they're invisible. Sometimes, like you're like, oh, you're you're into that guy because I don't see that in you. Yeah. And uh, it's like, well, yeah, because I I took the lessons from that and I grew. You know, yeah. that's so. Um, yeah, I know we've. I think we've meandered from your initial question of me, but like, I think what um, you're not fully in control of why your work is special to other people. And it took me a long time to accept that. Yeah. And um, I wasted, I don't, I didn't waste that time because I was producing fun work you and work that people things, enjoyed, yeah. but I feel like I should have accepted that probably 10 years earlier than I did. Mm -hmm. And just said, you know, what's what's whack about my stuff is also part of why people enjoy it, and I shouldn't get hung up about it. Yeah, I shouldn't. Well, I shouldn't try to polish my style so much that it becomes featureless. 
you know, I, yeah. I should accept the, the crags and the cracks that make me special, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, I mean, I talked to, I talked to Sebastian Pires, uh, Sebastian Pires off from the end. He's got this amazing style that he does when he's doing posting drawings on Twitter mm -hmm. and his comic book work is solid and, you know, well done and, you know, and it's repeatable. And I keep going like, I want the comic book that looks like this drawing, you know, because right. it's just so incredibly aggressive and fun. And, and he's like, I'm afraid, like, I'm afraid to like yeah. let loose. And I'm like, and you called it the hedge, man. It's that hedging bit. Like we, we, we will hedge where we think we could be safe. Um, but meanwhile, like there's this huge land of opportunity often if we do kind of cut loose a bit. Yeah. I you think know? so. Yeah, it's, it's cool. So, so I mean, how do you like, so, I mean, like for you, like, I mean, I guess the show, I mean, you've sort of evolved with the industry in that sense where sh shows became the, cause like in nineties shows were a thing where you would go get more work. Yes. Oh, for sure. You know, like you would go, you go to one of the big, in the big three shows, you would go get more work because the editorial people were there and, yeah. the publishers. and then that kind of disappeared and like, how did in you a way yeah i i, I mean the, the portfolio room went away yeah but there's still uh you it's still a way to network and get more work but mostly through meeting your peers yeah and then um and then you've got this sort of informal network that tells you when jobs are open or who's hiring or and they hear about gigs that they know you might be right for and mm -hmm. they connect with you so yeah it's still i still i think I think it's still probably the primary driver of getting future assignments, um, interacting with other professionals, either through social media or conventions. Yeah. yeah but, the, human, the human network, I think, is that's like the really like that's where it comes from. Like, I yeah. think you have to build those because, I mean, and it's not even saying social social media in the sense of like, I put something out there, I'm going to get work. I think yeah. you need to build the relationships with the people, regardless of if it's in person or if it's on a, yeah. you know, a phone. Yeah. And also when you work with, because so much of comics is collaborative. When you work with people, they talk to other people and, and they're like, Oh, what was, what was he or she like to work with? And, yeah. you know, it, it, it sort of, you know, it, it's just the way to, it's a way that I guess all business gets done really, <laughs> you yeah. know, in the world. But yeah. in comics, it's especially true because so much of it is collaborative. Yeah, it's it's an interesting the, the collaboration is so interesting because it's so layered and mm -hmm. it's extended. So there's this extended collaboration over the duration of the group that is making this thing. And and it happens sort of this, you know, like this onion skin of you know, writing to drawing to inking to you know, lettering and coloring and it's a really it's a really unique overlapping process um how when did writing come into your racket as because you're like hey i've got a pencil <laughs> and i'm making pencil i'm penciling comics and when did you like turn on the writing light? i was all i was always writing it just yeah. was not always for the public so in high school i was writing those amateur comics i was making with my friends hmm. same thing in college and then at the same time I was doing things like getting entry level jobs at Marvel and DC, I was also writing and drawing stories for like the really great kind of artsy anthologies that existed in the nineties, like negative burn and taboo and deadline um, right. places like that. I would, I would do my writing there and not really super be super aggressive about trying to get writing work in mainstream superhero comics because mm -hmm. um i didn't know if i had anything really to say about that stuff um, yeah. but all through the and then so sort of through the late 90s i started you know i was just trying to write and draw projects you know at the same time and then mm -hmm. late 90s early 2000s start i started thinking well I, sometimes i'm writing things that i'm not the right artist for <laughs> you know <laughs> like i yeah, like I, I wrote this story that I probably uh, there are better artists to draw, and 
the breakthrough for me was this book we did around the turn of the century that I did with my Cuddleston for Oni called uh, The Coffin. And it was it was sort of um, kind of a breakthrough for me. At lo and a, a lot of the success of that book rested on the fact that Mike Huddleston was so talented. His work was like, a, you know, like a huge bolt from the blue for a lot of people. Sure was. The story meant a lot to people you know young readers younger or people that were just getting into comics at the time and it sort of became sort of like the kickoff of this second half of my career as somebody that was known as both a writer and an artist yeah and what happened is those it's almost like the music industry again those people that were buying that cassette <laughs> when they were in in junior high you know our our record executives 10 years later you know and they, yeah. they remember that cassette so it's sort of like the people that were in college when the coffin came out became editors later mm -hmm. and they're like oh yeah this guy can write and so like to a certain segment uh, demographically of comics executives and editors and publishers i'm a writer um and to the ones that saw me drawing green arrow i'm an artist <laughs> Yeah. And then there's a few, there's like a handful, precious handful that I love so much that see me as both. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I mean, it's super interesting because, I mean, you you do have a dis, sort of defined difference, you know, like, I mean, because of the, you know, the sort of the variety of the work that you've done that you can kind of, that that, that actually happened, that, that's a problem for you, you know, I guess. In yeah. some sense, you know, like, it's like, oh, yeah, like, wait, are you the guy who wrote yeah. Or you know, like you know, yeah. like it's like you're almost like it's almost confusing. Yeah, like I just did a convention and I had my, you know, my rack of my wares and mm -hmm. at my table, and people are like, "Oh, did you work on all these?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I wrote some of them and I drew some of them," and <laughs> I and they go, "Did you write and draw any of them?" And I'm like, "Yeah, like maybe one of them, you know." Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I and I go, I know it's confusing, uh, but I. Like I said, go back to our original point. They're just different spaces on the dial. Yeah. And uh, to me, when I'm writing something, I'm drawing it up here. Yeah. Um, but I'm keeping it. I'm keeping an open mind about the way the artist is going to interpret it because they're going to have. They're going to bring some fantastic ideas to it too. So um, that's just the way I think when I'm writing. I think visually and. Um, Go, going back to the, the Oni thing, like, so oh, that was pretty early on for Oni, right? Well, they they kind of came online. Yeah, when, that was in the, I'd done a a couple of drawing gigs, I think, for them at that point. Yeah. Um, And the editors there were just open-minded enough that um, I, we cold pitched the coffin like a million places. Okay. okay. And it, um, I think the story is it got taken off the garbage at Oni. And like somebody saw it and they were like, oh, well, you know, that maybe we could, this isn't really in our wheelhouse, but maybe there's something we could do with this and talk to Phil about it. And Jamie Rich was my editor and he helped me kind of whip it into shape and, and lose some of the, the dead weight that was in the pitch and, and turn it into the book that came out. So yeah, it was, but it, it sort of began my relationship with them and it sort of, I, it kind of broke the ice with me for with like film people and and stuff because um james cameron bought it um oh, okay for a guillermo del toro to direct <laughs> way back before guillermo was like you know huge oscar winning sure. like, superstar that he is now and he wrote a treatment for it and it, it it's really awesome um but that was sort of like it opened um, some avenues for us so that like every new thing I created was like, at least get a look in Hollywood, which is somebody which was, is cool. somebody was paying attention to it. Yeah. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, let's, do, let's dip into that. Cause that's an interesting thing. And I don't think I've really kind of gone into that with people. So you do, you have a project that you do, you know, Hey, this is my comic book idea. Let me just set the frame about that, about that pitch. Was that a solo pitch from you or did you have, did you work it up with Mike? I worked it up with Mike. Okay. Um, we knew um it's the template when people ask me how i pitched it's sort of the template um i send them as we did a cover we did i think three pa a three-page scene from start to finish soup to nuts written drawn lettered 
so it could be red like mm -hmm. a comic book and then we did the springboard and then sort of a an overview of the whole thing okay so it was like an eight page document probably all right counting the art and it sort of became the template for the how i pitch things um but uh like I said, it wasn't super successful because Oni was the last place and Oni picked it out of the garbage. You know? so, so what I mean, so I, before we get into the this sort of the entertainment world of it all, but like, so what do you think the distinction was? I mean, you said that you worked with the editor to really kind of like form it into something that was what made it, you know, sort of mm -hmm. what it was. What do you think it what what was you know what was wrong with it? I'm using yeah. it loosely. Well, I, I'm so steeped in comic books, uh, you know, I'm, you know, born and bred here. I'm like a, you know, like a swamp monster that rose out of the, the morass of comics. <laughs> and so like, it was pretty comic booky, you mm -hmm. know, there were some, uh, the characters were a little too self-aware. They were, uh, that they were in a con, you know, they were some wise cracking in it. And there was like a comic relief character in it. And, the character had like was more clearly kind of a superhero, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, and they were like, no, you need to lean into the hero, into the horror of it more and um, lose some of the funny parts and, and make it, you know, a serious thing. And it always was. And I think the emotional, like the, like the touching parts of the story were already there, but uh, Jamie helped me bolster those by kind of removing the, the downbeats that were sort of counter to the emotional core of the story. There were mm -hmm. other beats that were going the wrong way, <laughs> you know, and he, right. he's like, those aren't contrasting and enough to help build your story. They're just distracting. So yep. you need to lose those. So he was really good about that. But what I think, uh, honestly, what I think appealed to um, most the people that did pick it up and have it resonate with them is that it's gorgeous. Mike Huddleston drew the hell out of it. Sure. <laughs> and, yeah. That's the unspoken, that's the unspoken, I think the unspoken um, secret of success for a lot of writers is picking great artists to work with. Sure. Um, and you'll find that like that exists at like the highest levels of comics. The competition for good artists is like savage. Yeah. And because a lot of people know that like the credibility of what you're writing really hinges on how engaged a comic book reader is by the what they're looking at. Mm. And that means having an artist that's interesting on some level, either they draw really great or their storytelling is really great, or um, there's something about that, or they have a huge name that, you know, has a built in audience. Those things all like help bolster your writing. Um, yeah. They don't make your writing better, no. but they make people pay attention. The you know, production values like you get you, yeah. you get a better budget with production values yeah or also like it's like casting an actor like you could write that the greatest screenplay of all time and if it's poorly acted it, it's not gonna mean anything to anybody oh my god um, yeah I, I would ruin every good movie <laughs> right and so an artist is like you know i'm gonna go get you know daniel day lewis to you know to, that's sure. be in my be in my comic basically is when you go out and grab a great artist, you're going and getting Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah. And so that makes the words you were written um come across to people and stick in their minds. So it's a big part of, of making comics and it's it's not uh, cheating in any way. It's an important aspect of it that you really need to nail down. And I knew that Mike was like on the cusp of really breaking through as a as a great artist and and I think he did that with a coffin and he's done it ever since he's, yeah. um, he hasn't produced comics full time since then he's, he's come and gone and done stuff in film and um, television. So, but it was sort of, uh, I got him at a good time, you know? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So, I mean, so when you get this, you get a, I mean, so when something hits and Hollywood, I'm using the term loosely, just pays yeah. attention. It's like what? Is, so, what's the experience like for you going through that? Because I mean, you know that, that it, this is the this is the sort of the the fantasy dream of everybody doing a thing. Right. Like, oh, if the bigger whale comes along, then I'm so set. You know. So, like, yeah. what is the what was the experience like for you? I mean, and good and bad. Like, what were the things that went through your head, and how did you mm -hmm. handle? It? 
I was lucky enough that this didn't happen until I was already in my 30s. Like mm -hmm. it didn't happen to me when I was 22 or I'd be like an insane person probably. Right. Uh, uh, but so I was 30 and I, I was, I had all their stuff going on. I had a family. I had, at the same time, the coffin was breaking wide. I was also like drawing DC's number one book. I was also drawing Green Arrow. So as an artist, I was. Yeah. I was busy you know, doing other stuff. So I didn't feel like my whole future hinged on um, this film thing. And we were lucky that it was like, oh, everyone knows who James Cameron is. It's a big deal if he options your, your thing, you know? And so I didn't, we were all very like, also I'm from Iowa. So I didn't get like that. Like it doesn't mean, Hollywood doesn't mean a lot to me. You know, like I'm not that it's not part of my dream is you, that, know? you weren't you were but you weren't looking at helicopter catalogs that that no happened? no <laughs> i was looking like <clears throat> i was like oh they're like well the advance is going to be this much which isn't great and i'm like yeah where i live that buys a house you yeah, know <laughs> right um so to me I, I always felt like well as long as i can just like scurry into your kitchen and get some crumbs then scurry back to my hole and make comics. That's that's all I really want from Hollywood. Sure. And if a good movie comes out of it, that's great because that's a miracle. I know it's a miracle when a good comic gets made. Yeah. So a good movie being made is a, like a double miracle. So you move, you move that decimal point over, you know, two or three spaces, it becomes a much bigger prop. You know. Principle. Yeah. What? So I mean, what? Like, what were you like? What was the sort of the process of exposure with that? Because I mean, so there's a point clearly that someone from the Oni side says, Hey, I mean, I'm guessing that someone from the Oni side yeah. says, Hey, this is the, you know, I guess at this point you're probably getting a phone call. Cause it's not, you know, yeah. no, wasn't the, the way of the day at all times. Yeah. Um, so you get a call from someone in the, in the thing, Hey, Phil got some interesting news, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. And then like, w like, so, I mean, you must've had some sort of, did you have, did you have some sort of, um, yay nay aspect at that point no no okay, okay. like they were so um i guess they knew they had something because they got a lot of nibbles on it from a lot of different directors okay or wound up in camp with cameron and um they were they it was kind of new to them too mm -hmm. so they were also really excited about it so they would call me with every new development they'd be like oh director x is interested or actor x wants to be the main character and um that was fun and exciting, but even that first round of it, like that was my first exposure to Hollywood. Even that first round of like, oh, it gets so far and then dies. It gets so far and then dies. You mm -hmm. know, just on that one project that happened so much that by the end of it, I was sort of inured to it all. And I was yeah. like, oh, I'll believe this when the check clears, you know, <laughs> and I actually, I mean, since I live in a small town, I called downtown and, and, and I'm like, Nancy, call me when this check clears, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they did, but, um, that's good. Uh, so I was, it, that stuff doesn't really like get to me. Like I said before, Holly was not part of my dream. Yeah. So, um, it's nice and it's cool. And, and so very few things go into production and get made even after they're optioned, um, that, uh, I mean, the way things work now, producers hang out at secret headquarters in Los, in Los Angeles when new books come out and they pick up every new interesting thing and they see, oh, is this something that could be right. you know, made? And you'll hear from, I, I don't think I've ever done a creator own project that didn't get a sniff at least. Right. And some stuff gets options, some stuff gets a producer option. And then occasionally a thing will get made, like Fry Breather got made, you know, and right. It was, um, that was like another level of, even though the money is different for television than film, mm -hmm. just actually knowing that like X million people saw your thing is, is exciting in and of itself. So yeah. Oh. That, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it's, I mean, it is strange. I mean, we, you know, the comic industry has its own level of celebrity, you know, yeah. and it's this interesting kind of thing. I mean, you know, we determined we determined there's only a handful of people. There's only one person with one name. Um, yeah. You know, so there's only one Frank. You know, and you know, there's you know, there's only one Neil. Like we have only right. people with single names that we we you know, 
and uh, it's a but it's a, it's a very small thing, even though it's gets oh, a lot yeah. of attention now. Like it's gotten way more attention than it's ever received. But nonetheless, it's pretty darn small, full of people who all oh, know yeah. each other and you know share their favorite beer on Twitter with one another, and that, yeah. it's not a big deal. Um, Hollywood it's like is a being, it's like being as famous as like a small market DJ, you know? Right? Yeah. Radio totally. DJ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you know, they, that that first weird moment when someone's asking you to sign something, you're like, yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, this yeah. weird, weird sort of like all right um yeah, yeah. It, it's so i mean but like when when it didn't like when it doesn't happen like do you did you have like did, was there a sense of relief was there a sense of like disappointment like what was the sort of or oh well and on you go yeah i mean it, are you talking about the film yeah 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 the only i mean the only the only sense of disappointment i had about it was i wanted to see a guillermo del toro movie of my thing For that sure. would have been awesome did you have what was your um, vision? i was oh, go ahead no i go ahead what were you asking me i was just wondering what because this is guillermo hadn't really really made a huge stand he made that. like yeah i think he had made chronos and chronos. what um, was the other one? um devil's backbone <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, so like people that were hip knew how good he was, you For sure. know, uh, but he wasn't the Oscar winning guy yet. Um, but um, I just wanted to be involved. I just wanted to be part of those guys' lives because they were so talented and yeah. like, have my story be the framework for what they wanted to do would have been so cool. And I even remember um, right after we signed the deal, um, our Hollywood guy was like, yeah, they're Cameron wants to do this new kind of 3D with that. No kidding, or, really. Oh, yeah. Okay, whatever. You know, 3D, right. that's your gimmick. And it was what he applied to Avatar. Yeah. It was that that was that 3D? Um, so I, I feel bad about the miss part of it that it didn't get seen, made or seen, but the comics still here, the comics still exist, the comics yeah. still mean something to people. So um that part of that part of that dream is like can't be diminished in any way yeah. so it doesn't bother me like well, so even if the movie came out and was terrible yeah uh it still couldn't diminish the book i'm so i am like the the anti eleanor like i don't <laughs> like the comic i don't care what happens to it later because the comic is the thing well you it's, know? i don't I'm feel like <laughs> anything that happens after can like tear down what i did you know no no like i mean we we you know, whatever, you know, whatever X-Men movie that wasn't good version of comic book run doesn't negate that amazing, you know, Chris Claremont, you know, right. story. Like it's still there. It's still, still races, you know, goosebumps and move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to hop back and then this, I think this will lead me to where I want to go. I want to hop back when you were talking about Frank Miller, um, and like so what like what comic books and artists were like the ones that caught your eye and kind of woke you up from looking at the guys who looked like you know Kirby but weren't Kirby for comics and you know at Marvel? That's yeah, uh, right. Um well I have to say that like even as a kid, I was drawn to things that were like a little bit off center, the little bit odd um appealed to me. Um, so like, while I enjoyed, like, I enjoyed all Superman comics, Spider-Man comics, you know, mainstream books, I enjoyed all those. But then when something came out that was a little bit weird, like Swamp Thing or E-Man or like creepy yeah. or eerie, you know, then I'd be like, oh, what's this about? Like, this is the thing I love, but it took a weird direction and it's taking me into a new place that I also love. Um, so I was like when I was even as a, a, you know, alternate alternate publishers were few and far between when I was a kid. Yeah. But like Captain Canuck came on the stands and I was like, that's not Marvel and DC. I want to I need to see what that's about. Or, um, you know, like for like the first time I saw Cerebus, I was like, oh, I need to see what that's about, you know, because yeah. it's not. And 
I was in, I think it was in high school when Pacific came out and okay. Yeah, sure. I made a, I made a concerted effort to get every Pacific comic book because it was, you know, like it had enough superhero in it to be familiar to me, but it was also a little bit weird and exotic and that stuff all appealed to me. Um, you know, like, and even inside of things like the Marvel universe and the DC universe, the stuff that appealed to me was the stuff that was whack, like Ragman is what turned me on about the DC universe or Adam sure. Warlock is what I liked about the Marvel universe. I liked the things that were like a little bit, like I said, off kilter, little, little fringe element there. Yeah. And so, um, so when the independent comic book explosion came along very early in my career, I was, I was like built for that. I was ready yeah. for that. You know, when Nexus is like oh, the ultimate yeah. Phil Hester comic, because, Oh, it's a, it's clearly a superhero comic, but it's also mm -hmm. clearly not a superhero comic, you yeah. know, and it's science fiction. It's an independent yeah. book. I, so I had a, a, my high school buddy was super hip and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, he had the first few issues of, um, of Nexus. So, I mean, mm -hmm. like, you know, I remember going over to his house. He's like, Oh, Hey, read these, you know? And, and I'm like, black and white comic books. What happened to yeah. the color? Like, yeah, and it, yeah. it was like, you know, whatever. And like, I think he was also the one who turned me on to the turtles. So I went to go pick up those, you know, those first two or three issues because he's like, Oh, you should check that out. You know? And it was just like that kind of cool period. I mean, American flag was huge for me. Oh yeah. Like, you know, I remember going to a couple comic shows I grew up in Connecticut and like, I remember like the dealers were great because they weren't only just pushing, you know, Marvel and DC comics. They were pushing all these alternative books. Um, yeah. Even like, even, the, even the Omega men, which wasn't or sensibly wasn't. It was DC, you know, but it was a weird corner. Yeah. 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 Like I remember the guys like, Hey, you should be reading Omega men. You should be reading Camelot 3000. I'm like, I should. Okay. You know, like I didn't know. Oh no. Did we freeze again? There you are. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. it was a good, it was a good point. Like it was a really interesting point because listen, I was really dyed in the wall. I mean, like, you know, you were saying about the odd stuff. I mean, I found odd artists interesting to me. You know, like I think like yeah. with Frank Robbins, I think Frank Robbins is kind of an odd artist. And I but I love oh, Frank yeah. Robbins artwork. So as a kid reading like the invaders, I'm like, this is really kind of cool because it didn't look like everything else. It was just kind of fun. Yeah. I there's like this magic period, like um, when you're like eight or nine, when like Frank Robbins and even Kirby um, or Pat Boyette are like, there. there's like a garish grotesquery about their work that like turn, like scares you a little bit and turns you off. Yeah. But it's almost like at 10, a little switch gets thrown where you're like, oh no, I like that now. You know, <laughs> I like that weirdness, you know, that's, that's yeah. for me. And for me, the one that really got me was Pat Boyette. You know, I okay. love Frank Robbins as well, especially his shadow book. I love the, his shadow. Um, yeah. But Pat Boyette was somebody, the first time I saw him, I was like, this is scary gross. I don't want to look at this. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I hit 10 or 11, and I was like, no, this is cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. I like yeah. this. Well, and, you, and it's like, you know, you're, it was interesting when you were you talking about Frank Miller earlier, or Frank, as we call him, mm -hmm. um, is that it was when he would do his own covers every so often, like during, during the run of daredevil, it wouldn't be Frank and Klaus doing the cover. Like Frank would do a, a cover. And it, it's like, you could see he was stretching his, his wings. He's like, let me just show you what I'm thinking of world. And then he like just punched us in the nose with, with a uh, Ronin, you know, and yeah. just sold this, this whole new way of Frank Millering. Um, yeah on paper i think he, i think he was just so i mean he's super talented for one thing but he's got a really beautiful mind and so he's always looking to looking for new territory and yeah. um that's why all those every one of those projects is looks it has a distinct look and mm -hmm. they're, they're all really satisfying you know every yeah. every change he made um was always satisfying and you know like everyone's gonna have a favorite like for me the peak was you know like those first three or four sin city books like mm, to me that yeah. was like frank you did it 
That's it. That's, <laughs> Bravissimo. That's Frank Miller right there, you know. And, um, but he's continued to like push and, and like what I admire about him is he pushes, he does he's not doing what people expect him to do all the time. And sometimes that takes him in a direction that like if you were a Dark Knight fan, you're not you don't want to see. But if you're a Frank Miller fan, um, you're there for the ride. You know, yeah. you, you want to see where he goes next. So you you have a have a great collection of work as this is that's the word in the street um how did that start for you <laughs> and can you stop <laughs> uh, well i mean i think i'll be able to stop someday um but it's it it really came down to i didn't know that part of collecting existed until i was quite a bit older maybe like okay. in my 20s and I was getting paid for making comics and I, especially at conventions, I could do sketches at conventions or sell my pages at conventions and then turn around and go to Albert Moy's booth and buy something with that. So I was like, yeah. Oh, well, it only takes three Phil Hester covers to make a Wally Wood page, you know? <laughs> and to me, that seemed like magic, you know, like, Oh hell. Yeah. And uh, I remember, uh, I remember sitting in a Chicago and like in my mind, mentally adding up how many, how much money I was making sketching. So I could go upstairs because it was on two levels then. So I could go upstairs and buy a Frank Miller Daredevil page because mm. back then they were 400 bucks. Right. And I did. That was like with, with like the first time I was really a pro pro, like I want to say it was 94 maybe. And I was like, I'm going to use this money and, and buy a Frank Miller page. And that sort of started the ball rolling. And I started buying people not – not just people I admired, but people that I thought were doing something different from what I was doing. And I wanted to see it up close and personal. And then also like, there's also a collector mentality about it because this seemed like comic collecting plus, you mm -hmm. know, it seemed like a deeper form of comic collecting. And so then I started getting interested in getting all the artists that meant something to me as a, an influence. Yep. Um, especially older guys, ECD artists, um, you know, even some silver and whatever I could get a hold of. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to have examples of all the my comic art fans. I mean, some, I, I don't think all those people are visible in my work, but all those people are part of like, you know, they made me who I am as a cartoonist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> It would be hard. I would be hard pressed to not make a list of at least fifty people who I would probably cite are, you know, influences. Now you might not say looking at the artwork that they're there, but like there's just so right. many factors. Um, and I get that. I totally get that. Like, and I I, I dabbled briefly, you know, in buying pages um, in the early '90s, and it was you know, that's when it was safe to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Like, I mean, like I bought a, like a Michael Golden page for 90 bucks. Yeah. Isn't and, that crazy? Yeah. And I mean, I sold it, it but because like, I realized like this stuff just sat in my flat files, unlooked, unviewed. I bought, mm. I bought Adam Hughes pages for, I think like 25 or 40 bucks. Yeah. You know, different world then. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I was like, I just, but like, I think like you, I wanted to see like the sort of the actual page. I'm like, oh, like. How, how is he how is he achieving this like what does it look yeah, like yeah sometimes it doesn't help sometimes like like <laughs> when you get an adam hughes page you don't learn anything it's a perfect <laughs> right 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 like yeah no there's a yeah. well nice thing is usually there's a sketch in the back so you can get to see something yeah else. sometimes uh, yeah i just bought a kevin i just bought a nice kevin nolan page and uh Kevin, I mean, we follow it. we're friends kind of and he was like oh yeah that page has some neat drawing on the back make sure to flip it over and it does uh -huh. on the back. He's, he's like worked out all the poses and faces on the back and then flipped it back over and redrew. So yeah, it is cool to see when, you know, when there's construction visible. On oh, the for sure. I mean, I, I and I'm, if I'm remembering this correctly a long time ago, Chris Sprouse used to draw on the back of the pages. Yes. And then, he's crazy and like, about it. He, he draws the whole comic twice. Right. Yeah. He draws it, he draws the whole thing in reverse. Yeah. Then, light boxes all that fi final pencil line. 
Yeah. Crazy. For well, I mean, it's just, you know, there is, it does guard against something, which is like, sometimes you draw something and flip it over and it looks weird and you don't know yeah. it until you flip it. So it does yep. guard against that. But other times I found that like, um, I flip something and then I flip it back and I'm like, it only works this way. It only, <laughs> you know, like it only <laughs> works one way. So I'm going to, yeah. it. you know, it looks weird flipped, but this way it really works. So it's, it's staying. Who like, so, I mean, like in the collecting aspect, like, you know, I'm wondering, like, have you, did you ever discover somebody like, you know, as, as a sort of a fan by looking, maybe looking through some original art going like, who is this? And then. Yeah, I was, I, I thought, um, I have to say when I first started collecting, I thought like to me, the sixties meant, uh, you know, Kirby, Ditko, Neil Adams, Steranko. Mm -hmm. And like, even though I liked Doom Patrol and I liked the idea of Doom Patrol, Bruno Premiani seemed kind of stale to me, like, because he was not part of that exciting bravura rendering style of those other guys. Yeah. And I, I started, as I became an art collector, I'm like, you know what? Actually, no, this guy's a really rare talent. And um, he, his drawing line is really evocative and his characters are all really alive. And I really became a huge fan of him through original art collecting. Oh, that's so cool. And and original art collecting just in and of itself broadened my horizons a little bit about what I, you know, what I consider cool and exciting artwork. And it's it's helped me to like stay that way to this day. I I think a lot of people when they get to my age, um, as even as just collectors, not necessarily as creators, they get this kind of kind of hidebound attitude, like, ah, oh, things were better, you know, like when I was at Right. And I, I think I'm a, I, I guess I got inoculated to that largely through collecting original art because I see new people coming along and to me, they're all super exciting. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I want to see what Tilly Walden does. I want to see what James Heron does. You know, uh, I want to see what these new creators are bringing to the table. And I like to collect the new ones too. So uh, my flat files are divided by decade and, oh, okay. and they're all almost to the top on all of them. <laughs> But oh. the, I'm happy to say that my my 2010 to 2020 drawer is just as full as my 90s drawer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I I mean I say it I say it all the time. I really feel like we're in a, another golden age of comics. Oh, yeah. It, it's the the level of talent that is on ex exhibition month after month in the in the stores is it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's really startling and cool. And also the the tastes of the general comic buying public have broadened quite a bit. Um it so it's almost like we've we've adapted the cable television method of storytelling. We're narrow casting almost now. So like yeah. the, we don't have to have a comic that sells two hundred thousand copies across the United States and it has to appeal to everybody, so it's gotta look like Kurt Swan, you know. Sure. Now yeah. we have now you can have a book that makes the creators a decent living if it sells 15,000 copies and it can be weird as hell because they found their people like Greg yep. we talked about earlier they found their 15,000 people and there are people that are comic fans that never buy a Marvel uh, or DC book really? uh, you know they only buy Image or they only buy Dark Horse and to me that's exciting and fun and um kind of the what keeps me energized about comics is that it's it's always evolving like that like i've been drawing it for i've been drawing comics for like 35 years and no five years has been like the five years before it you know right. <laughs> it's always a new a new chapter and i'm i'm kind of drifting into the old man comics phase of my career um but i'm still so energized by the things i'm seeing that i feel like i'm I'm breaking new ground with my work all the time. So yeah. I don't, I don't feel like I'm settling into the, like, you know, you see sometimes when somebody's an artist, like really exciting in their early twenties and then they, they stop growing, you know, yeah. because they reach the mountaintop and they're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do what I do because people like that. And then you become a parody of yourself. Yeah. And I don't think that's ever going to happen to me because I keep my, for one thing, I'm never on the mountaintop. So like, that's really good. Like I was like right here, it's safe. 
but um, uh, I'm always exposed to like so much new material through the art collecting and also just through reading how I still have a huge pull list. You yeah. know, I read all, all sorts of different books. So I'm exposed to new stuff that's very exciting to me. So I think it's helping me stay uh, fresh, at least in my, to myself. You know, like, sure. so when I sit down to the drawing board, I'm not, oh, it's time to make the donuts. When I sit down at the drawing board, I'm like, how am I going to push it today? And I I think people can see it in the stuff that I'm, I hope, at least that's what I'm hearing from people, is that they're seeing it, the stuff I'm doing on Gotham City Year One right now. Right. Well, I think, I think it's almost like, you, I think one of the best ways to sort of interpret the quality of what you're doing is that sort of internal Geiger counter of discomfort. Are you a bit uncomfortable, you yeah. know, in the in, in what you're doing? Because I think if you can kind of gin up that that those butterflies, you know, if what you're doing is making the butterflies happen, then it's sort of like, okay, I think I'm in the right area. Right. No, I think you're right. Because like one of the scary things I see with P uh, other creators that are in sort of my age cohort is. Uh, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name any names, but some of them always ha almost have it like a badge of honor, like, "Hey, kid, stop romanticizing this. You're, let's go make the donuts. This is how yeah. you do it. You stamp this and you stamp that, and it gets out the door." Because there's a romance to that. There's almost like this hard bitten. I'm the hard bitten, you know, like writer who can't sentimentalize what I do, you know. Right. So I just do it, and it's out, and the kids read it, and I think. I never want to fall into that. I was, I, as corny as it, like at the risk of becoming like the corniest person alive, like every one of these comics is like a little lifeline to another kid, like mm -hmm. in a little town in Oklahoma or wherever mm -hmm. that they're yeah. going to see it. And it's going to speak to them and gonna say, Oh, like there's this world, there's this like other world out there that we're, we're where art matters and where ideas matter and like if you can get one of those little like <laughs> like one of those little life boys out to somebody um like your whole career is worthwhile you know and, yeah. and so like i never want to lose that sort of, um everything i do i feel like it has to have a kernel of honesty um of expression about it of what i'm doing oh. that like somebody can recognize yeah no i love that i think that's you know, it, when you're saying that, all I could think about were the comics, you know, as a kid that made me want to do that thing. Yeah. And like how, you know, influential that they they were for me in my life. Like my life would not be what it is if it weren't for those people and those books. Oh, for sure. For sure. And like, yeah. Maybe it didn't mean, maybe they were just jamming, having fun. It didn't mean a lot to them. You know, they weren't conscious about what they were doing. Um, I'm conscious about it now because I'm 56, mm -hmm. but I I want things to count when I make them, you know? And I realize right. what they are. It, it, like sometimes they're just silly, silly books, but like just because something's silly doesn't mean it's not important. Um, no, and no. It can reach people. So how, like, you know, speaking of reaching people and, and the work that you're doing, like how, like what, how do you try to balance uh, strategically your, your work in the sense of like developing your own things and getting your own work, you know, published versus um, a publisher contacting you and saying, Hey, we would love you to do this. Or would you do this for us? Yeah, you, that's something I have to learn to be disciplined about because as I get older, drawing takes more of my time. Um, mm -hmm. It's just harder to do because real life, as you get older and your family expands and then even after your kids move out, your family is still expanding in a way. Yeah. Um, and you still have more to care about and take care of. So your time at the drawing board is, is different than it used to be. Um, so drawing is more demanding for me and I, it also takes time away from my other aspects of creativity so i've been drawing full-time like for almost two years now and it i haven't written a ton during that time you know a few things here and there um and i really miss it like i miss writing badly and i, I want to get back to that so I, I think i need to 
be a little bit more choosy about saying yes to things just because they sound fun mm -hmm. and um, definitely carve out some time. And also that's, this is how I make my living. <laughs> like it's yeah. important to make a living making comics. And a lot of times when I'm writing something that I'm taking a flyer on that, like yep. that's a lot of things I've written have not made anything. Right. Um, yeah. No matter how much I like them, a few things make a lot and some make almost nothing and a lot never make a dime. Yeah. So uh, I have to, when you're talking about looking for that balance, it's largely my, um, you know, checking account that decides what that balance is. <laughs> so like, it's, it's like, you're healthy now, you can take some risks or it's time to get to work. Like, don't say no to, you know, whatever comes down the pike yeah what is what is your i mean it, i'm really curious because i've been truly fascinated talking with younger creator younger comic book artists and how fast they do pages nowadays and i just i, I you know i'm blown away by it but like what was your you know what how long is it taking you to do a page now versus how long it took you in 1996. oh boy well i mean i had a month in 1996 where i did I think I did 72 pages, you know, yes. and they weren't great pages. <laughs> like that's also right. the month I decided to stop doing that. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but now I'm, I'm like, I feel good if I'm penciling a page a day. Okay. You know, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. I mean, like I, that's about my, yeah, my, my good pace. And then, uh, go ahead. Oh no! I was I was the, I was <laughs> we're both frozen, staring at each other. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things where like nobody told you how long that day was supposed to be. They were just saying you need to do a page a day. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm up at two in the morning. Sometimes I'm yeah. done at five. Uh, and then also, uh, sometimes I need to go run my mother-in-law to the doctor for a day, you know. And then tomorrow has to be a two-page day. So. Yep. That's just the way it is. Um, uh, but writing is, that's another reason I'd like to get back to writing more because it's less physically taxing than drawing. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a lot of heavy work when it comes to the, you know, the melon to get the, get everything to line up. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of staring at a wall, yeah. um, but um, there's not a lot of bent over the table at three in the morning when you're writing. No, and you can and you can talk to yourself, and people aren't really look thinking you're too crazy. So yeah, it's all right. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's it's fine. It's fine. Well, I hope you get to do some more writing soon. I know it's. I mean, as a person who found writing a little later in their life, it is by far the greatest uh, single expression that I've had in my in my creative and en you know years. No, I'm looking forward to it. And I think I'm almost certain I will. So uh, hopefully um, what the problem is these write, these drawing gigs keep coming that I'm like, can't say no to. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll get a little break. I'll, I'll the next one I'll be able to say no to <laughs> yeah. at least for a few months. Well, I, I, I hope, I hope you get, I hope you get, I hope you get a writing assignment and, or you can get that pitch out that you want to, that you, that's burning. Oh, there's, pitches li there's pitches lined up on the runway and they're running out of gas. So I need to yeah. get them. Yeah. Got to, got to, got to refuel them and get them out there. Yeah. All right. Well, I've, I have enjoyed talking with you thoroughly today. This has been absolutely fantastic to get to know you uh, that much more. Um, what can people like, is there anything people can like expect to look for you out there. I appreciate it. Oh. Is there anything that people can expect? To, uh, um, right now, I've got um, Gotham City. Your... Go ahead. No, no, I'm saying I, you, you know, do your thing, do your pitch. <laughs> yeah, right now, what I've got on the stands is Gotham City Year One, okay. um, which is a book I'm drawing that Tom King wrote, and it's being yep. inked it's by cool. my. Thank you, by my longtime ink partner Eric Gapster. And uh, the color is Jordi Belair, and it's lettered by Clayton Cowles. So it's a really great group effort, and it's it's a it's a really neat book, and it's something that is kind of new ground for all of us. And I'm happy for people to see it and enjoy it. And it's been getting a pretty good response. So I can't yeah, everything I've seen has been ridiculously good. Um, yeah. Clayton is 
Amazing. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Saves the bacon. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and Jordy, I told Jordy yeah. that like um, when editors send me my own work to proof, I can't look at it. Like I can't stand to look at my own work. Uh, except when like Jordy colors it. And yeah. then I can like, oh, this this isn't half bad. And it's largely right. due to it's largely due to like Jordy whipping my half ass drawings into shape. He's a good cinematographer. Well, he can't complain. No complaints. Yeah, um, very much so. Yeah, and then uh, you're on Twitter, so you're you're pretty you're pretty uh, you're pretty good at posting stuff. So easy to find you there. And that'll accessible be there. Yeah. That'll be I'll, that'll yeah. be the description. And I'm at Bill Hester there, and it's equal parts me complaining about getting old, uh, um, uh, talking about like a career in comics and posting my original art buys. So if any one of those three things appeals to you, it's worth following me. It is, it is worth following you. I, 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 I enjoy it. So um, I think other people will as well. Um, Phil, have a great, what is it? What day is this? Tuesday? Jeez, it's early in the week. feels like it's Friday already. It's Monday. Is it Monday? Oh no. It's Monday. The time change has destroyed your sense of well, what's I have what. To go I have to go to New York on Thursday, so I'm, 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 I think oh boy. over already. Um, yeah. but yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks well, for taking luck. the time. Yeah, man. It's great talking to you and, um, keep it up. Um, you're, you're 26 at heart. Yes. I'll go with that. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Thank Until you. Then, all right. We'll talk later. Bye-bye.